Hello everyone. Today we'll be discussing interstitial space and how they affect fluid distribution. In the previous lectures, we considered interstitium as a large space constituting about 20% of its body weight which accumulate fluids. That was a simple model to understand some basics of the fluid movements, but we need to take it further so as to explain more complex phenomena that you observe daily but cannot explain. Knowing about interstitium will help you understand and manage IV fluid and diuresis. Interstitial space has also other function such as being conduit for diffusion of gases, nutrients and product of metabolism. Cell signaling and immune system encounters with pathogens mostly occur in interstitium. Interstitium in fact has three constituents. It constitutes of collagen fibrils and spindle cells and fibroblast. It has a gel phase made up of glycose aminoglycans and between the gel phase there is an aqueous phase where water can flow easily. Different organs have different proportion of basic constituent and these differences result in different degrees of edema in different tissues. Note the ratio of collagen to glycose aminoglycans and hyaluronin in different body tissues. Skin has got more collagen to glycose aminoglycan ratio as compared to muscle or lungs. We'll know the significance of these ratios as you progress in the lecture. Collagen phase consists of collagen triple helix and it can entangle water molecules. It has got almost a neutral charge and your interstitium is usually made up of type 1 and type 3 collagen fibers. It is associated with thin flat cell which are spindle shaped and express CD34 molecules and this along with the collagen they channel the flow of interstitial fluid into something we call aqueous phase. Around 1% of interstitial water is normally within this gel free phase through which water can flow alongside collagen fiber bundles and their associated CD34 interstitial cell. These microscopically appear as fluid vesicles and rivulets. The proportion of the aqueous phase increases in interstitial edema and this is where you start seeing pitting edema. The fluid in the aqueous phase moves with applied pressure so it leaves this dimple when you apply pressure on the skin. Edema begins to form very early but becomes apparent clinically when you have about 3 to 4 liters of interstitial fluid accumulation. The other entity which is your non-pitting edema is seen when the fluid is accumulated in your gel phase as fluid in the gel phase does not move with applied pressure. Gel phase is made up of glycosaminoglycans, mostly hyaluronin which is negatively charged and it has got other molecules such as heparin sulfate, dermatin sulfate and keratin sulfate. This holds 99% of your interstitial water. Gel phase is important because it restricts the movement of water. So the water flows through your aqueous channels but not through your gel phase. Gel phase also form a diffusion barrier to larger molecules and also slows the spread of organisms such as bacteria. It stabilizes tissue shape and it does not allow large and negatively charged molecules to enter the gel phase, something we call excluded volume. So albumin, which is large and negatively charged, is present only in the free-flowing interstitial aqueous phase and in the lymph within the lymphatic vessels. It is completely absent from your gel phase. This is important to know because it reduces the volume of distribution of albumin significantly. For example, in rats, Around 41% of your interstitial volume in the skin is excluded from albumin. The concept of excluded volume is pretty simple. All it means that if you've got two large molecules, they cannot occupy the same space. So for example, in this figure, you have got glycosaminoglycans and collagen and albumin cannot fit the space. It can only fit in the spaces which are not occupied by collagens or glycosaminoglycans. So for example, this space. And this space is, is your aqueous phase. And the other thing that causes your excluded volume is charge exclusion. And that is because of your electrostatic factors. Since glycosaminoglycans are negatively charged like albumin, the amount that is excluded is much higher. And albumin cannot enter these spaces because of the negatively charged glycosaminoglycans. So gags are more exclusive due to their negative charge as compared to collagen. The amount of exclusion also depends upon the hydration level of glycosaminoglycans. So as your interstitium becomes more dehydrated, the percentage of excluded volume increases. So in case of albumin, the volume of distribution of albumin falls further as you become more dehydrated. 
So it's important to know that the volume of distribution of albumin changes with volume status. Interstitial albumin concentration differs in different organs because of different leakiness in the capillaries. So you can see because of different capillaries and their characteristic, kidneys almost have no proteins in the interstitium, while liver and lungs have got high amount of proteins in their interstitium. In all these organs, the albumin is present only in the aqueous phase of the interstitium. Other electrolytes and water and small molecules can move easily between the aqueous and gel phases and they move according to their osmotic, hydrostatic and electrochemical gradients. Glycosaminoglycans attract water molecules and swell up by taking water. Under normal conditions, gags are undersaturated with water. That means they can swell more by absorbing more water. These are also negatively charged and they attract sodium ions and this generates an osmotic pressure due to gibbs tonin effect as well, thereby absorbing more water. One of the things that you have to note in this is the sodium in the glycosaminoglycans is a non-osmotic sodium as it is in very close proximity to the gags. Given this fact, skin has shown to have a large non-osmotic store of sodium and plays an important regulatory function in salt and water homeostasis. The glycosaminoglycans, collagen and the cellular structure are integrated via a network of beta-1 integrin system. These interaction and the interaction between these fibers causes negative interstitial pressure. So interstitium has subatmospheric pressures. Lymphatic maintain this subatmospheric pressure by actively pumping out water from the interstitium, thereby keeping the interstitial pressure negative and glycosaminoglycans underhydrated. Interstitial hydrostatic pressures are different in different organs. While they are negative in most of the organs, encapsulated organs have positive interstitial pressures. Patients with burns have much negative interstitial pressure while tumors have highly positive interstitial pressures. Let's understand the function of glycosaminoglycans in inflammation. Enema in the skin associated with acute inflammation occurs very quickly. If you remember my previous lecture, total body capillary filtrate rate excluding kidneys is around 4 to 6 ml per minute. So the amount of fluid that is filtered in hand will be really very small. So to go from normal to edematous hand with this rate of filtration will normally take 1 to 2 days to complete. To explain this quick onset edema, the fluid flux across the capillary should increase by at least 200 to 300 times above the normal. And for this, you need to increase your net filtration pressure gradient by at least 200 to 300 millimeters of mercury. Now, during inflammation, net filtration does increase because the permeability coefficient increases by two to three times. The Steverman reflection coefficient drops down because of endothelial injury and glycocalyx disruption. And your peak capillary can rise slightly as you lose the autoregulation. However, all these factors still cannot explain the large change in filtration rates. And scientists have figured out that this is all because of drop in your interstitial pressures. During inflammation, they have observed lowering of interstitial pressure as much as minus 150 millimeters of mercury. In endotoxic shower models, in many studies, your interstitial pressure has been seen to drop to at least minus 10 to minus 20 millimeters of mercury. And this increases your hydrostatic pressure gradient and promotes edema formation. So why does a interstitium becomes so low during inflammation? And this is all have to do with your beta-1 integrin system. During inflammation, many of the pro-inflammatory molecules such as histamine, TNF-alpha, IL-6, interferon gamma, etc. disrupt the activity of alpha-2 beta-1 integrin. And release of this integrin drops your interstitial pressures and promotes edema formation. Other factors that may lower interstitial pressure include adrenergic vasoconstriction and vasopressors that you use in septic shock. One of the things to note that in these cases, the lymphatics cannot increase the removal because of excess negative interstitial pressure. In fact, inflammation also reduces local lymphatic activity, thereby promoting edema formation during inflammation. So during inflammation, increased fluid filtration and glycosaminoglycans imbibe the fluid from capillary into interstitial space and therefore can cause life-threatening hypovolemia, which is seen commonly after first six to eight hours after burn injury. 
During sepsis, massive extracellular matrix degradation has been observed, sometimes called systemic wound. And this has been confirmed by measuring type 1 collagen telopeptides, which are a marker of collagen 1 degradation. And you can see that in sepsis, the levels are much higher than controls and they are even higher in non-survivors. So the inflammation generates negative interstitial pressure and therefore volume loss from vascular to interstitial spaces. This also explains some key finding in sepsis. You have observed patient developing intravascular hypovolemia as more fluid seeps out and less is returned because most of the fluid is getting imbibed in these glycosaminoglycans. This fluid will be unresponsive to diuretics unless the inflammation improves. And this is one of the things I want to take away is that every edema is not diuretic responsive. Interstitial pressure can also rise when you manipulate your integrin alpha V B3. And this can happen with other molecules like platelet derived growth factors. Once you compromise alpha V beta 3 integrin, your interstitial pressure can rise and thereby reduce the edema. Other molecules such as VEGF, insulin, vitamin C and corticotropin releasing factor have been shown to manipulate your integrin alpha VB3, therefore increasing the interstitial pressure. Other changes in interstitium during inflammation include inhibition of lymphatic pumping, which we'll talk about in a separate lecture. This is a very good review article about role of interstitium during septic shock. I encourage to go through it. Next concept is your interstitial compliance. Compliance is nothing but change in your interstitial volume divided by change in interstitial pressure. So if you apply same pressure and your volume increases more, it is a highly compliant area as seen in skin, scrotum, periorbital area, etc. While less compliant areas will expand less and these are commonly your encapsulated organ such as your kidneys, liver or brain. Encapsulated organs have more resistance to edema formation because the interstitial pressure rises more rapidly, thereby increasing your lymphatic flow and decreasing your filtration gradient. These unfortunately are also the organ which will be subject to compartment syndrome because same amount of volume will generate your interstitial pressure by a much higher amount. Another interesting thing to note is that interstitial compliance is not linearly related to interstitial volume in highly compliant areas. So even with large increase in edema, interstitial pressure rises only by few millimeters of mercury. And this is the reason why edema occurs so commonly in the scrotal areas because these are highly compliant. Compliance of the interstitium depends upon your hyaluronin and collagen content, degree of hydration, and whether your organs are encapsulated. One of the things that you might have observed is sometimes in certain patients giving an extra one liter of crystalloid can result in pulmonary edema. And let's understand what happens. In this interesting experiment, they measured interstitial pressure and wet to dry ratio of the lung weight. They also measured proteoglycan levels in extract, which was a measure of lung inflammation and injury. When they infused 120 ml of saline to these rabbits, their interstitial pressure increased from minus 10.5 to plus 3.6. However, there was very little change in their wet to dry lung ratio. Their proteoglycan levels in the extract rose, but not by much. However, giving them extra 20 ml of saline did not change their interstitial pressure further. However, your wet to dry lung weight increased significantly along with the proteoglycan levels. So there seems to be an inflection point in your pre-interstitium where you transition from interstitial edema to severe edema. And this is associated with proteoglycan breakdown, which might greatly affect interstitial structural organization of the extracellular matrix. So interstitium is not just one space. It is made up of multiple subspaces. There is a rapidly equilibrating interstitium, that's your aqueous phase, with the size similar to your plasma volume. There is slowly equilibrating interstitium, that's your gel phase, and this will accumulate fluid when you infuse large volumes or when there is inflammation. There is a non-expensile ECF that is present in your bones and cartilage. When you give fluid to a person, the fluid first redistribute between stressed and unstressed compartments. Some of this fluid will leak into this rapidly equilibrating interstitium and will return by the lymphatics. And this aqueous phase will slowly equilibrate 
with the gel phase. Let's examine what happens in sepsis. In sepsis, you develop vasodilation and your interstitial pressure becomes more negative because of the systemic inflammation. Because of the low blood pressure, you give these patients IV fluid to maintain the blood pressure. The fluid first redistribute in stressed and unstressed compartment. However, because of the continuous leakage from the capillaries and more negative interstitial pressure, fluid starts accumulating in small pools or lacunae in the aqueous phase. This fluid will slowly equilibrate with the gel phase, increasing the interstitial volume. And this is where most of the fluid goes. Once your sepsis resolves, the fluids redistribute between the stress and unstressed compartments. And since your interstitial pressure are not much negative, lymphatics can remove more fluid from your interstitial space, mostly from the aqueous phase, and this phase will be responsive to your diuretics. Gel phase equilibrates slowly with your aqueous phase, so this process is a little bit more slower and will be less responsive to diuretics. And finally, as inflammation improves, your interstitial pressures are no longer extremely negative and gel loses more fluids more rapidly. And this is the part where you see autodiuresis if your kidneys are functional. To summarize, interstitium is not one space but has got multiple subspaces. It has a gel phase which constitutes of glycosaminoglycans and holds about 99% of interstitial water. Aqueous phase normally holds around 1% of interstitial water. Accumulation of fluid in aqueous phase results in pitting edema. Gel phase excludes large and negatively charged molecules such as albumin, acts as barrier to diffusion and water movement. Degree of edema in the tissues depend on interaction between glycosaminoglycans, collagen, spindle cell, constituent cells and beta integrins. It also depends upon interstitial compliance, interstitial hydration and integrity of various beta integrins. Interstitial pressures are usually negative and decrease with inflammation, thus imbibing more water, causing intravascular depletion. So distribution of fluid is more complex than what is traditionally taught. There are many variables that affect the volume of distribution of the fluid that you give to your patients. In this lecture, we understood the different phases of your interstitium and movement of fluid in this area. And we also learned that inflammation in sympathetic system, apart from affecting your vasculature, also affects your interstitium by a great deal and can influence volume distribution. Thank you. These are the references. The links are in description below.